Jesus has already been on the cross and has uttered three words. The first was, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And then he said to the repentant thief, Today you will be with me in paradise. And thirdly, he addressed his mother and John, the beloved apostle. Behold your mother, behold your son. And the fourth word that Jesus utters from the cross is, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We look at Matthew's gospel that he says from noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. So almost six hours have gone of Jesus being on the cross. It was almost three in the afternoon. And we see here Matthew saying at about three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is the only word of Jesus in the Gospels of Matthew and Mark. Both Gospels relate that it was in the ninth hour, after three hours of darkness, that Jesus cried out this fourth word. And the ninth hour was three o'clock in the afternoon in Palestine. Just after he speaks, Mark relates with a horrible sense of finality and Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. As the darkness deepened that afternoon and his faithfulness seemed to have amounted for nothing but the ordinary death of a million faithless people's death, he felt that the thing that he had lived with so long, this hope and the presence of God, so intimately associated with it had vanished with the light. In his cry can be heard many human cries, but one of them is a man of faith's most terrible shock and dismay that he has been wrong all the time. The cry of protest is one of the most sincere prayers that human beings ever pray. It is part of that fight against the unacceptable situation which is the first natural response on the part of people with energy and spirit. Inability to believe that the worst has happened struggles with rebellion as the realization sinks in that it has in fact happened. In the life of faith, this tension that forms the initial experience of shock is expressed in the prayer of protest. It is basically a prayer of faith in that it assumes a view of life as reasonable and explicable. And the prayer of protest is found quite extensively in the Psalms and in the book of Job. The prayer of protest, so clear in the Bible and used by Christ himself, is so infrequent in the public prayer of the church. Through the media, we're exposed to all the evil that is happening around us, we look at the wicked go free when an innocent person is shot dead and the accused can walk around scot-free. There's a tremendous sense of anger and protest within us that this is not the way it should be. But it is never part of our public prayer. We think of the economic inequality around the globe, of the disparity between the rich and the poor in our own country of the exploited women and children in our country and our heart protests. Yet little of this religious emotion is expressed in public Christian prayer. Behind this unwillingness to be honest to God is an unrealistic view of faith as imperturbable and frictionless. It's to have a sentimental view of our relationship with God. The absence of verbal strife does not imply the presence of love or intimacy. In any marriage you can see that some conflict is a natural and healthy aspect of intimacy. Its absence in a marriage may look at the exterior as a healthy marriage, but probably would not stand the expression of differences by either party. Where there is deep love in spirit and in truth, Husbands and wives are able to express themselves freely to one another 
and can share their negative and their positive feelings. In this sense, a certain amount of conflict can be instead of waning love, it may seem one of the many forms of deep mutual involvement and unity. Why did Jesus utter this cry of protest, of being forsaken by God? What kind of relationship did he have with the Father? And why does he feel forsaken now? On this Good Friday, I want us to look at three particular things that we can find in this relationship with the Father. First of all, that Jesus had a deep relationship with the Father. And then we see there is a separation from this deep relationship with the Father. And then finally we will look at what this protest of God forsakenness tell us. So look, let's look at the first section. Jesus had a deep relationship with the Father. When Jesus began his ministry as he came out of the water, heavens were opened, the dove came down upon him, and a voice came from heaven saying, You are my beloved son. With you I am well pleased. And therefore we see God the Father's seal of love on Jesus. There was this deep intimate relationship. You are my beloved son. With you I am well pleased. And this intimacy between Jesus and the Father was visible throughout his life. Whenever Jesus did a miracle, he always called on the Father. When he fed the 5,000 people, Jesus took the five loaves and the two fishes, looked up to heaven and gave thanks to God. When Jesus called his disciples, he went out, spent the night in prayer, intimacy with God, and then he chose his disciples. When he raised Lazarus from the dead, he said, I thank you, Father, that you listened to me. I know that you always listen to me. And then just a few weeks before his death, we see that in the transfiguration, Elijah and Moses appear and Jesus is transfigured. And a cloud covered them and a voice said, This is my own dear son, listen to him. And so we see that throughout the life of Jesus, there is this deep intimacy with the Father. Jesus and the Father are closely connected to each other. Their love for each other is visible, both from Jesus and from the Father. And so we see this intimate relationship that Jesus has with the Father. But at this point, he's crying out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If Jesus had this intimate relationship with the Father, what is happening on the cross? And that leads us on to our second point, that on the cross... There is a separation from this deep relationship with the Father. When Jesus was on the cross, there was no voice from heaven reassuring him. Jesus was cursed for us as he hung on the tree as it is written. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree in Deuteronomy 21-23. No words of comfort or ownership here. If the Father had wanted he could have sent 12 legions of angels to save him. But not an angel came to Jesus after he left Gethsemane. There were no seraphims to protect him when the people mocked him and spat upon him and lashed him and sent the nails into his hands and put the crown of thorns on his head. As they drove the nails into his hands and feet, no ministering Spirits came to rescue him. And therefore we see here that he appears to be forsaken, smitten by God and afflicted, as Isaiah told us earlier on. Jesus was God forsaken at this point. What can we say? Truly that the Father abandoned the Son for a sake, for the salvation of the world. But can we really grasp the mystery and the majesty of this truth? Hardly. As Martin Luther once said, God forsaking God, who can understand it? Yet even a minuscule grasp of this reality 
calls us to confession, to humility, to worship, to adoration. And why is this God forsakenness happen happening? It is because a holy God cannot stand in the presence of sin. And Jesus takes on the penalty of all human sin upon himself. He became sin for us so that we may become the righteousness of God. And therefore at this point we see there is an actual and dreadful separation that took place between the father and the son. It was not a separation which was forced upon him, but one which was mutually agreed by the father and the son. His God forsakenness was because of our sin and their just reward. Christ took upon himself the sin of all humanity and therefore at this point is alienated from God. And he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Sin and holiness could not go together. Jesus expressed his God forsakenness by quoting Psalm 22.1, which aptly described his experience. The God forsakenness needs to be balanced with the biblical assertion that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. So the divine abandonment, abandonment was real and Jesus indeed experienced God forsakenness. So we see that in spite of the deep relationship that Jesus had with the Father, at this time there is a separation from this deep relationship with the Father. Even though it was temporary, even though it was agreed upon, Jesus feels the weight of human sin and the abandonment by the Father because a holy God could not be in contact with a sinful human being. God in Jesus takes on the sin of humanity. God was reconciling the world himself in Christ and therefore this cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Thirdly, we move on to see what does this protest of God forsakenness tell us? What does this protest of God forsakenness tell us? There are many situations when we may feel that we've been abandoned by God. When there is a very difficult situation in our family. When there is a tragedy or an untimely death or a divorce or a son or a daughter who is sick and who is not recovering, for whom you have been praying for a, for a long time. And you said, Lord, where are you? And you feel that God is not answering your prayers, that God has abandoned you. And you cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Many of you may have gone through that situation where you have felt that there is no one for me. God doesn't answer my prayers. I've cried out to him. I've been praying for him, for my son or for my daughter or for my husband or for my wife or my friends. But God doesn't seem to be answering me. He, all my prayers are going on deaf ears. And you feel God forsaken. Our greatest encouragement is that Christ has been in that position. And he knows and understands what we go through since he himself was there. Pleasures can be attained without pain. But it is only through so suffering that joy can be experienced. And the lesson that we learn from this prayer of protest is that we are allowed to make prayers of protest. Sometimes people think that we cannot pray protesting. But the prayer of protest should not remain there itself. The prayer of protest needs to turn into the prayer of faith. God will answer this prayer because he is a faithful God. And so today as many of you are going through difficult situations. In your work spots, in your families among your children, among your spouses, financially, and you feel that God has abandoned you. And you seem to be saying the same thing, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
we are allowed to pray this prayer of protest. But we cannot stay there all the time. We need to move from the prayer of protest to the prayer of faith, knowing that God is there for us. Jesus went through this prayer of protest, even though he knew that it was a momentary separation from the Father. He knew that the Father meant well for him. He knew the love of the Father. He knew that he would come out of this, that he would rise again on the third day. That trust and faith was in the Father. And so when we go through these difficult situations, when we go through these mountains that seem to be too high to climb, when we feel that God is not answering our prayers, Jesus' cry on the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Helps us to understand what it means to feel God forsaken. Jesus understands your problem. He is with you. And we are allowed to pray this prayer of protest. But may that prayer of protest move into a prayer of faith that we would continue on in our relationship with the risen Christ. May God be with each one of you. Let us pray. Father, we still our hearts before you and we thank you for this cry of protest. We thank you, Lord, that even though Jesus experienced God forsakenness at that time, we know, Lord, that you didn't abandon him, that he rose again on the third day, that he is seated at your right hand, interceding for us. Lord, as we go through difficult situations, encourage us, sustain us as we feel God forsaken. Lord, reassure us of your presence. Reassure us of your love and see us through it that our prayers of protest will change into prayers of faith. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.